Uh, all right. Good evening, everybody. We are live. I'm broadcasting this live both on uh, Facebook and uh, through our BWB Capital Partners Facebook page as well as on the Zoom link. And of course, if someone is not able to make it, this will also be on the BWBCapitalPartners.com website uh, if you want to jump in later. So good evening, everyone. What a great day. Uh, no tornadoes, hopefully, in your neighborhood, in your neck of the woods. Um, was out at Hershey Park today, got soaking wet during the middle of the day, but always a lot of fun. So hey, you know what? That's another reason why you should be on these calls for uh, passive investment, real estate syndication, so that you can spend more time with your friends and family, doing the things that you love, and have the options to say uh, yes figure it out later when you want to do certain things. So, good evening. Do, do any of my partners want to jump on and say hello before we get started? Hey, Chris. Just want to say hi. Thanks for uh, leading this. Really, a uh, little bit about, I just, my name's Damon Hall. I, I've known Chris for about 10 plus years and he's, you know, he's great. And, you know, we're just interested to continue having this discussion. All right, thank you, Damon. I appreciate the kind words. Uh, Chantel, do you want to say anything real quick? You look like you're popping on there. I was just going to say hi to everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. I am interested in hearing about all the bad things about passive investing. <laughs> I do love that. Seth, why don't you just jump in and say hello real quick since I see you're uh, chomping at the bit there. Yeah, well, I'm not chomping at the bit. I just I was just talking and I realized I was muted, so it doesn't uh, doesn't always work that well. Um, yeah, so I I was excited. We've been talking about this topic for um, a couple weeks now, so I'm really excited to be able to share it. I know in my offline conversations, this is something that um, either is asked directly or people are nibbling around the edges of it. You know, um, they're not trying to seem like they're scared, but um, you know, as far as investments go and risk, um, this is pretty low on the totem pole. So I'm looking forward to uh, sharing everything. Tonight. All right. Well, thank you for saying hello to everyone. So yeah, tonight we're going to try to keep the format to a 30 minute sort of informational educational portion. We know that time is important to everyone. We want to keep things uh, as simple as possible. There's going to be a lot of education uh, in the upcoming weeks as we move forward. Uh, and then we're going to try to leave 15 minutes on the back end. Hopefully, as uh, some of you who are participating on a more weekly basis get more comfortable, you can either, of course, uh, send us questions via the chat window, but more preferably, we'd love if you jump on, even if it's just audio, if you want to say hello, introduce yourself, uh, or at least just ask a question. So um, one, of the, one of the great benefits, we're going to jump into it, right? We're going to jump into it right now and talk about... Um, uh, the negatives, the cons. And the reason that I want to say the negatives and why we like to talk about it is because one of the things that uh, I, I bring to the table as well as some of my other partners is we have all seen um, both together and in our individual industries situations where uh, people are hoping for the best, right? They just talk about everything going right, right, right. And I think enough of us uh, in this group, as far as the general partners go, um, have all met Murphy uh, from Murphy's Law, if you know what I mean, <laughs> uh, to know that that's just not the case. Nothing will ever uh, go uh, quite smoothly. In fact, I think about that, um, jumping back real quick to things like um, when they talk about like actually getting, when they got the man, on, when they landed man on the moon, like there's no direct line. It's not like a straight shot. It's just, a, it's a constant course correction. Uh, until until you uh, until you uh, land on the moon. So I thought about that. Like we like to think of things as being a straight shot. So one of the benefits uh, for us also working together as partners is that for um, ten years, as we turned a very difficult uh, homeowner association around, uh, it was just underfunded, uh, poorly managed. Um, some of it really not the owners' fault because they're owners. They're not property managers. They didn't really know what they didn't know. Um, but when you're dealing with, uh, with that and trying to get homeowners to understand that you're not trying to be punitive, but you're in fact trying to, uh, you know, solve the problem, uh, even though it stings the, the pocketbook, um, there is a tendency, uh, to have a, the, the challenge there. So we had to work through a lot of that together. And even some of the things that we laid out, you know, we talked about things in the future, what would happen if, if certain items weren't addressed, uh, that it could expound the problem exponentially. 
And then of course the Murphy's uh, law, you know, shows up and wham, we get whacked with like $120,000 drainage project that nobody really expected. So what all this means is that, you know, coming into this, working with our investors, the people that we're trying to network and create this fund with, uh, we want them to understand that uh, real estate investing has risk and and we're looking for a certain profile, a certain uh, person who can understand uh, that this, you know, we have every intention of putting the money to the proper work and making the best decisions and making the most money, but there's also going to be potential for risk. It's just, it's just what you're in, you're in dealing with. Uh, and, and any fool would tell you guarantee, you use the words guarantee, right? I hate that word guarantee. Uh, you know, absolutely. Or they, you know, anything to those effects to me would be more a sign of someone as a syndicator. I would want to, would le less likely want to work with, uh, not more, because again, if we're giving you pie in the sky promises, then, then you should be looking a little deeper at what we're saying. So whenever I'm working in any situation, I also look, like to look at what are worst case scenarios. And I think in, uh, especially in multifamily, uh, real estate deals, um, it's best to be conservative. It's best to expect your expenses will be higher than you plan for, that you should have more vacancies, that maybe you don't hit the, the rents that you expect. Uh, and even the program that we are working with, um, when you sell the property, it basically automatically assumes you're going to sell it at a higher cap rate, which means a lower price uh, than when you bought it. So by, by creating all these what if worst case scenario situations, what ends up happening is that uh, there's really nowhere to, where to go but up. If you're prepared for the worst, right? Prepared, uh, hope for the best, prepare for the worst is what I like to tell uh, my investors. So let's talk about a couple of those uh, risk items. And again, if any of the other board, uh, board members feel like jumping on, if there's any uh, individual um, topic I'm discussing that you have any personal experience in with your own, own industries, feel free to, uh, to jump in. Um, so, you know, we're in a hot market right now. Um, stock market's doing really well. Whenever things are riding high and the market's doing well, people have short-term memory. I still remember 06 to 08. I still sting from that, uh, from that market. So while the market's pretty hot right now, I'm, I'm um, going to be a little bit of a cynic and remember that, hey, what goes up must come down. So multifamily properties, multifamily deals like any investment, uh, they are affected by uh, market cycles. Um, so in the long run, apartment buildings have historically performed better. Uh, than residential real estate or the stock market during a downturn. But just like any other uh, investment, uh, markets, uh, multifamily is not immune to those uh, cycl cyclical markets either. However, uh, the good news is that we can mitigate some of that um, cyclical market um, problems by investing in the right locations. Um, certain areas that are subject to high fluctuations, we'd probably want to stay away from. Like I would not want to invest in the San Francisco area right now for all the D in China. Um, because you know, a simple, a simple market correction could mean huge numbers for someone when you're, when you're talking about people who are now paying for $4,000 a month for a one bedroom apartment. I mean, it's just, the prices are just, they're just crazy. Um, so, you know, what our job is to do is to do our homework, uh, to look at the locations, which we talked about in one of the prior um, episodes. Um, and we want to be looking at multifamily real estate in stable markets. So areas, certain parts of Texas, uh, Memphis, uh, Tennessee, um, parts of Tennessee, parts of the Southeast, um, uh, Florida, Atlanta, um, and possibly even uh, South Carolina, North Carolina. So there's a lot of, of areas for us to choose from. But what we're looking for are those more stable markets. They don't get affected by uh, too much of the two highs and they don't get impacted uh, by the lows. So the other issue that we're seeing right now is um, the, there is a lot of building going on. Uh, multifamily housing is a hot market. Uh, we are seeing a lot of construction right now. I was just out in Denver uh, two weeks ago and I was just floored at how many apartment buildings are being uh, built up. And these are big buildings. These aren't, these aren't 10, 10 or 20 unit buildings. These are 50, 100, 200 unit um, uh, buildings. Some of them like, you know, four or five story type low rises. Um, 
And uh, which that in and of itself is not necessarily the problem because typically as uh, renters rise up into those uh, brand new, uh, lux- typically luxury apartments, uh, it means that it allows people to move up into those uh, uh, C and then B properties. Um, the problem right now with the, uh, with the, um, with what we're at, you know, with the overbuilding is it's, it's kind of putting us into a potential vicious cycle because um, the developers are only putting up luxury. So, so no one is really putting up those mid-level uh, properties. Um, so where that could end up having a effect uh, that we would avoid is that if the market does take a downturn, typically those luxury apartments see a higher uh, vacancy rate. So as much as I would love to be, be, to be buying those disney properties right now, those A-level properties, um, we want to stay out of that market because those top-end fringes are going to be the ones that are going to be probably hit hardest. Uh, we kind of saw that down in uh, parts of Florida when they were doing the, the condo rush. Everyone was building condos and renting them out, and all of a sudden, entire buildings couldn't be rented. So obviously, we want to get stuff that's more in that stabilized um, situation. All right. So uh, we have regular market cycles. We have overbuilding uh, vicious cycles. Uh, what is another risk when you are talking about uh, multifamily housing or a real estate syndication? Uh, the team, right? Who is the team that's in place? Just like uh, there are bad doctors and bad lawyers out there, there's also bad uh, teams. Uh, the syndicators, the people that are that are bringing to it to you, um, obviously you have to feel that you can trust them, that they are you have to have confidence that they know what they're doing, uh, which is why we are doing these episodes and having these so that people can get to know us better and, uh, and uh, inter, you know, interact with us and learn what we are doing. But it's not just us as the team. Really, when it comes down to boots on the street, you're also dealing with um, uh, the manager, the management. So you know, if, we, you know, if we're dealing with an inexperienced or incompetent manager, uh, they are liable to make mistakes. What we have, hopefully, though, it, to uh, to mitigate that is the fact that um, we have probably, I guess, between Chantel and I alone, uh, we're over 20 years combined experience in multifamily property management or large property management, commercial property management, um, even if it's residential. Um, so, you know, what that really kind of gives us is a leg up over other operators or especially newer operators, because we know how to read the books. We're going to know how to, we're going to know how to look at that profile of that management company. We certainly know how to ask the right questions to verify they're actually doing the right things, not just in, uh, maintenance or management of the property, but also things like, you know, their tenant screening, their tenant screening. Um, so that gives us the ability to really interview and kind of get to know these management companies and find out, you know, who are they? What is their track record? You know, what are their, what are their processes that they have in place uh, as far as um, tenant screening, uh, uh, background checks, things like that? You know, what is, what is their maintenance? How do they handle maintenance? How do they handle inspections? Uh, obviously how well will they communicate with us? How, how well will they communicate with renters? And, um, even if we're working with the manager, the question will be, you know, for the company they work for is how good is that property management company? So, you know, I, that's, that's, oh, I, you know, why another reason I get so nervous when I hear about people investing in like single families, I'm part of a group right now. A lot of young, a lot of young investors are, are flying across the country to buy singles in Cleveland. They live in San Diego and um, the, pro- the property manager in those situations can c- certainly make or break a deal, especially when you're dealing with winter and frozen pipes. So I think about that on a larger scale with, uh, with a management company. So just like any business, right? You can have two McDonald's in your town. One McDonald's can be really well run and down the street can be a McDonald's that's really poorly run. They're both the same brand. They're both selling the same thing, but the experience you get with two of them are completely different. The same can be said with a property management and how a property is run. So a really good asset can be poorly managed, uh, whereas the same asset down the street can be uh, professionally managed and bringing in more income with less problems. So we will definitely be looking at um, you know, who is on that team with us. 
Um, and, uh, and we feel like we can grade them a little bit more than some of our competitors can. All right, so this one will not affect us as much, but uh, depending on, again, some of the investor profiles we work with, they could get into this kind of multifamily housing, but we're not really looking at HUD or Section 8 housing. Um, there are some properties that we've come across in our research that might be 80 or 100 units and they're 100% subsidized. The pros are for that, that they are government backed uh, properties, which means you're getting steady cash flow from uh, the government every month for those units. The negative is you're dealing with the government every month. And again, when, when we talk about everything going right versus things uh, going wrong, um, if the government is involved with it, I can assure you there will be a delay in time. So um, right now, from a, uh, from, from a legal perspective, as far as legislation, the, 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 what, what laws are affecting real estate apartments, multifamily housing, uh, we would not be as affected as much because I personally am not really looking into any of the HUD or Section 8 housing or uh, subsidized uh, assisted living. Um, you know, so we're not really affected by that. But again, depending on what we're looking at, uh, where those properties are, we're going to want to be aware of any uh, potential uh, legislation locally or otherwise that could affect that. Chantel, you look like you wanted to jump I in. I do. <laughs> I have a little antidote to that. While it may not be Section 8 housing, one of the um, cities we were looking in that had um, a rather large university, uh, we found out from the local realtor that they had been trying to buy up many houses and apartments where it was making it very difficult for apartment owners to either sell or expand. And so um, while you think of big government, also local, local government, or even kind of, you know, who has the ear of the board of the, the zoning is a big thing. Um, so, you know, it's important to do our research, which of course we would, and just find out kind of things you wouldn't know if you didn't live there. And so I think that's just an interesting, because I had no idea that they had so much pull in this one city. And so to actually be aware of it kind of changed the path and trajectory of what we were looking for. So being aware of it is just half the battle. So just want to throw that in. <laughs> it's uh, it's interesting that you say that it is true that uh, local government can have a bigger effect on, especially if you look at things like student housing. Yes. I mean, there's, there's, there's uh, certainly uh, properties that we could look at that are near. I mean, I follow, if it follows the big three that we'd be looking at hospitals, universities, uh, major hubs of transportation, I mean, schools fall under universities. So that it doesn't mean that we potentially wouldn't be looking at student housing, but you'd be surprised. You're right. The local government, how much they can affect. Oh, can they affect, you know, what you're dealing with in real estate. So, uh, Damon, did you have something to say? Like you were going to pop on. I was, um, there's, there's also, you know, the larger, um, situation, which is, you know, the tax ramifications. So there's been some very positive tax changes recently, but those are the kinds of things that, you know, in the future. And so it's right now, it's very investor friendly, very real estate friendly. And that's one of the things that really drives, you know, people who gain wealth out of, you know, a lot of it's done through real estate. And a lot of it is because of the tax advantages. And so in the future, that could go away, that would impact everybody. But it's just those things that, you know, we try to be aware of and, you know, make people aware of before it happens. It's, it's interesting you should say that because I, you know, we do follow under that guideline of people have to live somewhere. People, people got to live somewhere, as we say. But, uh, you know, there's no doubt those who get, uh, who get their fingers in the pie, who really start to learn about real estate investing, um, there is no doubt that the, this government, especially, you know, the, the U.S. government, I can't speak for any other countries, um, the, the laws here are very favorable, favorable for uh, multifamily housing ownership uh, with both tax breaks and um, just the way that they set the businesses up. And, and, and it's important. It's because they need investors like us going out there and providing housing because if there's no housing, then, well, we have a much bigger uh, homeless problem. And we can't have that, Seth, now can we? No. And another thing I wanted to bring up is um, one of the reasons we're going down in the South and those states have in common are the um, the fact that they're a little more landlord friendly than up here. Um, so that takes out some of the risk as well. Um, you know, so it, it's all about kind of head, just like Chantel was saying, doing her due diligence going in, 
you know, us, us deciding kind of where we want to go with the, you know, depending on weather and tenant law, um, you know, all those things, all those risks can be kind of hedged. Hey, in Texas and uh, Virginia, you can lock a tenant out. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> sounds good to me. No, I'm just so kidding. <laughs> you know, and, and listen, I, you know, I, I don't ever want, I, I don't ever want to be seen as like, you know, Scrooge McDuck, you know what I mean? Like, I don't ever, like we manage property. I'm salt of the earth. Like, you know, I get involved in programs. I give back to the people in my community. I realize that there's people with hardship, but I, but I got to tell you after having, you know, managed properties professionally, uh, for darn near 15 years, um, you know, the number of the number of cases where the tenant is not shooting themselves in the face on the way out the door, causing themselves own problems, you know, bringing in pets where they shouldn't, you know, you would be, um, you would be amazed at how many problems uh, tenants cause themselves. Um, and uh, these laws that are written to be tenant friendly, the people who write these laws, they mean well, but they really aren't in the streets realizing like how much damage a, a bad tenant can do. So it's not that I think most landlords want to be super, like I don't think they want to be overly picky. I think everyone would just love someone who would just pay their rent on time. That's what a good tenant to me is. Someone just pays their rent on time and doesn't really cause too many problems. And that's really probably your 80-20 rule, a large percentage of them, but there's always that 20% out there that, you know, they're going to, I mean, we've had people lie. I mean, the stuff that we've seen come through that because we catch them through our screening, you know, you have to realize there's somebody out there who's not doing, uh, who's not doing the homework as well. And they're ending up with those, those problems. So it is nice to kind of know that there are some States out there that aren't quite so, um, um, tenant friendly, because again, the, the perception is that every landlord is a rich fat cat. And I can tell you that is not the case. There are many hard working men and women out there who have put time and effort into, uh, building their portfolios. And, um, just because they've put the time and effort into the risk to, to build that doesn't make it automatic that they should foot the bill when someone does 15, 20, $30,000 worth of damage damage. Um, but again, those are worst case scenarios, uh, and and every property owner uh, is going to have a situation at some point or the other. So I don't want you guys to be concerned about that. Um, it's just a fact of life. You're dealing with people, and um, whenever you're dealing with people, you can expect um, you can expect craziness to to follow suit. So so those are some things that we talked about as far as risks involved with um, the properties itself. Right, we're talking about. Uh, market cycles, uh, overbuilding, poor management, legislation that could affect both taxation and um, uh, uh, and the property itself. So what about you as the investor, right? Um, uh, there's a couple of things that you need to understand. And again, that's why we're having these uh, discussions to, to, to research the profile of the investor, understands what they're getting involved in. Something that you need to know about investing in, in multifamily whether it's syndication or through your own investments, is the illiquidity of real estate. This is not like we're buying gold where I know what the spot price is and at any given time uh, I can pick up a phone and sell that on the spot. Uh, this is not cash. You know, Cash is very liquid. You can go to the bank, you can pull it out, you can stack it on your table for all you want. Uh, this is an illiquid investment. What that simply means is it's it's a little bit more difficult to get this in and out of the market as far as cash goes. So your acquisition takes a little longer and your disposition takes a little, a little bit longer. And because of that, uh, your money is tied up until we can refinance or sell the asset. And you don't have access to it in the meantime. And that is an important factor. So if you you know if you think you need cash quickly, uh, this is the real estate in general is probably not the right investment for you. Anyone who is working with us or would like to know more about working with us, they need to understand that, um, you know, you are putting your money to work for you to help you build your, uh, to your portfolio and, uh, and your passive income stream. So that means in the beginning, uh, you're putting your money to work for you, but it's not something you're going to pull right back out within a quick period of time. So if you have the means and the patience to keep your money in the asset for at least five years, it could be as little as three, but you should mentally be prepared for a five-year deal. Then the payoff is more than worth than the, the temporary inconvenience. Uh, and that is a, that's an important factor for investors to understand. You know, uh, 
people want overnight success. And the reality is that overnight success is really uh, just like um, smoke in the wind. Um, there are far more people who have put the time and effort in and patiently built their portfolio and uh, become what people appear to be overnight successes. Uh, but the reality is unless you're winning the lottery or you're inheriting sudden wealth, for most people, uh, they need to have some patience. Um, so again, the, the investor profile, you should be prepared for putting money to work for you for at least five years. Chris, it's a crock pot, not a microwave. It's a, it's a crock pot. And, oh, I like that Chantel. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> like, <laughs> crock pot investing with Chantel. <laughs> that <might. laughs> Throw that might. No, that's a great way of looking at it. In fact, I was in, um, I was in uh, Cabo uh, in 2018 on a retreat down there, and I remember listening to um, uh, one of my buddies, Chris Crawford um, from uh, Montreal. He he tells this story about like remember like looking in the mirror at the subway station bathroom, like washing his face. He had nowhere to go, you know. He, he had nowhere to live. He was like this, is like he was at the rock bottom of trying to turn his life around. And over the next 10 years, he built this business from the ground up, um, uh, doing marketing and things like that. And I think he's got like eight or 10, maybe 12 employees now. And you could just see the look on his face. Like this guy had worked so hard and people were kind of giving him agita over his successes. And I just kind of whispered in his ear, like most people will not understand it took you 10 years to become an overnight success. Um, so, you know, do not get carried away, oh, investors out there in their interwebs world with uh, instant wealth. Um, you know, there was a, their, 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 the higher the risk, the higher the reward, the higher the risk. You should always be aware of that. Uh, and if it seems too good to be true, well, it probably is. So, you know, at least with, with us as partners, uh, you know, we will, one of the reasons we, we work together so well uh, is because we all have high ethics and the reality is we all know uh, that we'd rather be realists. It doesn't mean we're pessimistic. Uh, we just want to certainly be as um, as honest as possible in preparing investors for what we're getting ready to do. Ready to do. So I think it was uh, Seth, maybe Damon, I forget which, but they were saying like, look, this still is a great investment and it is true. Real estate syndication with multifamily is a low risk profile, typically above average returns, Huge tax benefits that can make it really safe and lucrative. And, um, and we can even further mitigate those risks by looking at the right kinds of properties and those class B and C properties. Again, we want to be in that workforce zone right there in the, in the middle. Um, yes, Damon, go ahead. I, I, just wanted, I just wanted to talk about one of the trade-offs too, to the, the illiquidity of it, because you were talking about that. But, but one of the things that is, is beneficial so even if your investment isn't as liquid, it also isn't as volatile. And so that's one of the things you can put your money in the stock market and it can go down 30%, you know, over time. And so probably, I mean, there's no guarantees, but in five years, the investments aren't probably going to be worth 30% less than what they are now. Right? No, that's, that's, a, that's the nature of commercial real estate investing. That is a good point. And you could put the money in and the stock market could drop 30% af moments after you put it in. I think I was just looking at that. Uh, was it Tesla just dropped? Somebody just dropped. Apple just dropped. Somebody just dropped 6 or 10%. I was thinking that would have sucked if you had just bought that. Or how about those people that just put all their money into IPO for, um, I think it was Lyft. I don't know, one of them recently. It's like, well, there goes your money. Like someone had to put that money in. Someone paid at this and someone picked it up at this. So uh, no, that's a very good point, Damon. Um, and, you know, having gone through a, um, a downward cycle in um, the 2008 and beyond market, uh, I actually picked up uh, quite a bit of property management business because of the down market. But, but people have to live somewhere. So good market, bad market. So in some of the areas, yes, there were owners who couldn't sell their real estate, but they were still able to to rent those assets out until the market corrected. So in that case, you are correct. Unless it's something super catastrophic, uh, even with a downturn, like I said, people have to live somewhere. So if we have those right middle ground properties, it's less likely 
you know, it's, it's unlikely you'll see rents drop 30% in a single season. They could drop, but that would be a drastic drop from a thousand dollar unit to go to $700 a month. I mean, that would be, that would be extraordinary. I, I, I would say guys, if, if it drops that much, the least of your concerns is going to be your investment in this. It's there's, that would be some kind of systemic collapse of biblical proportions, a 30% drop in rents over a year. So, um, you know, I, I would say that, uh, yeah, that definitely you're, you're hedged, you know, this investment is definitely hedged against some of the more, um, uh, shall I say fake investments, uh, and more of the, uh, digital, digital variety. So, yeah, that's a good point. We won't ever see, you know, I don't think any apartment complex is going to go up as high as cryptocurrency did. Yeah. You know, I, I can't buy an apartment building and rent an apartment for a thousand dollars. And by the end of the year, they're running for $20,000. Yeah, I guess it could happen, but I'll be, I'd be scratching my head. That's for sure. Um, so yeah, listen, again, we, you know, we, we, we always want to couch it with the fact that once again, BWB Capital Partners and the group that you are listening from, we are not creating anything new. We are taking real estate syndication, which is a tried and true practice for real estate investing. And we are simply bringing it to our group and beyond uh, as just a method that we want to do. So we are not inventing the hamburger. We're just repurposing another way to sell it. Um, so listen, that was a, yeah, wow, half an hour went by very quickly. Um, I see, uh, like I said, I see Julie, Tina, Jeff, uh, some other people on here. I don't know if anybody wants to jump in and ask some questions, but I figure at this point, why don't we, uh, switch over to a little Q and a and, uh, and open it up. And if there are no questions, we, we can end it, but I just figured why not, um, see, so Jason is going to be shy. He's not going to get on with us. So we'll go here. All right. So Jason asks, if we see a downturn in the market, could your strategy be to buy and hold and wait it out? Um, so Jason, are you asking like, are we, are you presuming we have not acquired that property yet? Yeah. If we see a downturn in the market, would your strategy be to buy and hold and wait it out? So I presume what you're saying is if we see a downturn in the market, are we looking to simply buy and hold? Yeah. So if it was already acquired, um, um, yeah, I mean, you know, unless the property is, unless the property is really losing money, um, the likelihood is if we're in a down market, then I'm going to make the same advice I would make to the investors that I would to, uh, any investor, which is unless it's losing gobs of money, we would probably want to ride it out because the market conditions will correct, you know, will it correct in 18 months. Maybe not. Will it correct in three to five years? Typically, uh, at some point the market's going to regain traction. Um, could there be t p potential buyouts, uh, if people did not want to go long-term? Yes. But, but typically anytime there's a buyout, uh, strategy, uh, you're going to lose your money. So you're going to lose your money. If you, if we sell the property at a loss, you're going to lose your money. If you take, if you take uh, your money out early, uh, through a buyout. So in those situations, we've already acquired a property and the market takes a downturn, then it's going to be a matter of where do we, where do we, uh, minimize expenses. And, uh, God, we were just talking about this last night, I think, uh, with the group that, you know, the best businesses do not withdraw in a down market. They actually attack because you want to stand above your competitor. So in a down market, we might say, Hey, how else can we make these properties better for our customer? Cause a tenant is the customer, right? The tenants are living there. We want to create a better product for them, not a worse product. We don't want to. We don't want to skip out on repairs to try to save money because we're in a down market. Because then we might have more turnover or poor tenants moving in. We want to always increase the product. So yeah, there's no doubt there can be times where we might be uh, uh, gunning it, but that's um, how we're gonna look at it. All right, Jeff throws a question out here. Chris, in my professional experience, the best multifamily deals are off market. What are you guys doing and what multi-state relationships are you forming in order to get the first crack at some of these properties before they actually hit the market? Uh, great question, Jeff, and one that uh, as a board, we just had a meeting about the other day. And uh, everyone in the group uh, has a territorial area, a couple different states. And right now we are in uh, handshaking mode. So um, everybody's reaching out. We're looking for what we might think are good deals. I think we're positioning our wording right. Uh, to introduce ourselves with those brokers uh, and uh, let them know the kind of deals that we're looking for. 
So yeah, it's going to be relationship driven. And um, look, in the in the end of the day, there's you know you're right, Jeff. There they are good deals. They're going to be coming out. So what we want to do is build those relationships. And that's that's going to be the key word there, is building the relationships because uh, when they have those off market deals, we do want to we do want to be contacted. But that's not something we're going to build overnight. And that's where uh, you know you guys come in as we build the uh, relationships and. Um, uh, sorry, it looks like Jeff raised in. As we build these relationships, they need to know that we're serious too, right? Right now, we're still in the fact-finding stage. And what I mean by that is we're building a pool of investors. We still have to have our individual calls to find out how much capital we're working at because then that's going to help us make a decision like where, what price range we're in. Are we looking at cash acquisition? Are we looking at, uh, at financing? Um, Hopefully that answered the question. Again, Jeff, uh, we're going to be talking off offline again anyway, so hopefully um, on a one-to-one -one we can get some of that answered for you. All right, Tina asks, uh, how would you handle a situation where a property was acquired and it was soon determined that the existing property management company was not up to snuff? That's exactly what happened to us. Yeah, Chantel, Chantel, Dana, and Seth, why don't you guys jump in and answer that? Because you guys, you have the experience of, of, uh, of turning over management. Why don't you go ahead and give so them So you quickly that. put out the feelers for new management. And you interview these management companies and you find out who knows what they're talking about and who can handle, you know, managing a property. Um, in our, in our um, townhome association I was president and we had just moved in I was there for a year before I knew what was going on and then I ran for president because we went to the annual meeting and people were literally screaming at the property manager screaming it was the, it was the most bizarre thing I'd ever seen and he wasn't answering the questions he just he'd act like they were crazy but they were asking legitimate questions they were just frustrated because he didn't communicate and I you know I was in real estate, but I was young in real estate, but I still knew this, this was not <laughs> good business practices. And then I got really worried about how everything was being managed from anywhere from budgetary to even communications. And I was going to say communication is one of the biggest keys in property management. That is the, that is where, you know, what's going on. They're your ears on the ground. Um, they're also the, you know, the tenant relation aspect that is so important as well. So, um, once I got on the board and was elected president, uh, we made fast strides to, now this was back on like Craigslist, I think we put it out. It was just a, you know, it was years ago, <laughs> 11, 12, I don't even know. Um, and that is how we found Chris. And we interviewed him in a local Starbucks and he clearly had a good grasp of what property management should be and what, you know, just things, he was telling us things that I, I knew it had to be true, but I knew we weren't doing it in our um, management company at the time. And so. <laughs> yeah. Like when I was like, so what's your reserve budget? And you're like, what's a reserve budget? What are you talking about? This? <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, those are clearly red flags that I, I knew for sure we needed to get rid of the guy. <laughs> so um, we ended up hiring Chris telling him he would start in January. So then we had to relay this to the old property manager, which was incredibly awkward, but you know, you have to do the hard things. And I'm so glad we did because if we hadn't, our poor little townhome community, I don't even know what we would have done when we got the snow bills, things later on that happened that thank God we had a reserve and thank God we were prepared. Let's, because let's, let's be more detailed. I came in and after about six or eight months, I was like, guys, if the township comes in and says they're going to repave your roads, you have no <laughs> money. You're, you're 150 minimum short. Yeah. I was like, you need a quarter million like yesterday. And everyone looked at me like, this couldn't possibly be true. But I think deep down, you knew, you knew it was true. We did. The, the property manager, I, I don't know how long he had been there. I couldn't even get that answer because um, no one really knew. Uh, but he had never raised the dues and he had never um, set away budget, like set away yeah. you know, reserves. So it's, we would just, we, if, if it wasn't being managed well, the answer is we would, too sweet go and get a new management company and get it on the right track and 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 just to kind of follow up on that um because the the fact is we would know again because i'm in the business chantel's been in it from a corporate side um and the four of us have seen it from managing large projects i mean a simple hey 
you know, we're buying, let's say, a 50 unit building, give me the digital file of all the leases. Yes. And I can tell you just by looking at the leases, oh, are we dealing with a proper, you know, if I'm dealing with lease, yeah. You'd be amazed what you can learn about the landlord or the property manager uh, just by looking at the leases because typically if they're, dis let's just put it, if they're disheveled, if they're incomplete, if they're a mess, then property management's gonna be, a, gonna be a mess. So the more succinct, the more that they're able to give us their numbers and things like that and show us their records, if they look like they're in clean matter and they've got the back, so then it's more likely they're gonna be a professional company, but you know, we, we would know. So it's not like we have to get into it and then find out, oh my God, we've been doing this for six months and we're just beginning to realize these guys are incompetent. There's a very good likelihood we're going to know before the deal's even finished just by getting the information whether or not we're all going to be putting the wheels in motion for um, um, the next one. All right. Uh, let's see here. Another Jeff, uh, another tough hardball from Jeff. Here we go. As far as risk goes, the market is probably at the top or close to the near uh, term uh, top. How comfortable are you buying and expecting to be able to turn it over for a profit in a short time, three to five year period? And what is the uh, plan for reserves for any major unplanned expenses? There you go. Uh, again, boom, boom. I, I love when people ask questions that we've already discussed uh, in our prior meetings. Um, so that's a good question, uh, Jeff. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we are looking for some blue chip properties. I, I would say right now, if I'm looking for the very strongest returns, then some of the value add properties we might be looking at would be the ones that carry some, some high risk. So if the investor pool that we put together for one specific property for a value add fund is willing to take that on, then we could be looking at some of those properties that are in, in you know, they might be you know, D plus C minus properties that we need to move into that C, C plus range. Um, if we're not looking for that risk, if we're looking for something that's more steady, then as we've discussed on some of the prior uh, uh, calls, uh, we might be looking at more like your blue chip, something where it's like, look, let's find something that's in a good steady market where they've maybe done one third to one half of the renovations, but there's still some meat on the bone. Um, you know, where can we go where we can, you know, kind of look at expenses, maybe see where we can, you know, how can we adjust rents? Because in the end, Jeff, as you know, um, you know, these properties, they're, they're financed or their, their sale price is going to be based on their cash flow. So even at the top of the market, as long as we're not overpaying for an asset, as long as we're not, you know, uh, trying to, uh, uh, rub elbows or push elbows and elbow somebody out of a deal where we're paying, whatever, just because we want to have traction. Um, I don't, I don't recommend that strategy unless it's really, unless there's something really else that I'm not aware of, like a new building expansion, a new hospital going, like if there's some major piece of construction going on, it's going to bring jobs. I might be willing to take that on, but for the most part, uh, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask anyone to, um, to go into some of these markets, uh, where we're going to be competing. Um, but as part of that, also, what is the plan for reserves for major unplanned expenses? And that's part of what we look at when we are discussing um, uh, property review. We are factoring in um, um, those reserves right off the bat. And I think the one I had, it was like $250 per unit per month for like nine months of the year. I wanted to have it. And when I went through my numbers for the software that we use for deal analyzing, um, I think I came out, I was actually higher. My reserves for the uh, property were actually higher than what even the program recommended for the deal to be a good deal. So uh, I will say my board, my fellow board members here will attest to it that uh, when it comes to the unplanned expenses, that is the purpose of the reserve. So we could look at it from two ways, Jeff, and one might be what are the reserves we're putting away every month from the rent, the gross rents that it's collecting and or Additionally, um, we might look at a property and um, say we, I'm just using round numbers. If we needed to do a million dollar capital raise for a 500,000, for a $5 million property, excuse me. Um, if that property is worth $5 million, we might do a capital raise of like $1.5 million. So the million dollars is the 20%. You're acquiring a $5 million property, that $500,000. This is pretending there's no closing costs, which we'd have to raise too. But let's just say that half a million dollars, the idea of that would be okay, that, that might go the 10% right into the reserves. 
It's still the money. It's still a part of the company. It's not money that's been spent, but it's money that's been put in the reserves uh, so that should there be a capital improvement expense in the first couple of years that we're not caught unawares. So hopefully that, um, hopefully that uh, answers that. Jason, what's the current plan? Jason asks, what's the current plan for raising money? Is every deal different as far as what is offered to investors? I don't think that's what we're looking to do, uh, Jason. I think in the end, what's going to happen is as we have one-on-one -on -one discussions with each investor, we're going to find out more about their kind of uh, investor profile, like their, their, their psychology. What is it they're looking to achieve? If we don't have something to offer them, we don't. If, they, if we do, whether we were talking about those, those blue chips uh, or the triple net or storage, what we would then say is kind of put you in a category like, okay, this is the group of investors we pulled over here, Jason and a bunch. These are guys, uh, men and women who are looking to invest X number of dollars in multifamily and understand that we're looking at more blue chip. But if I have three or four investors on the right side who are saying, hey, we've got the capital, we want to go after you know a land development deal or straight triple notes like that, then we would, we would put them in there. So it's really going to depend on each individual investor and where do they feel comfortable. And then what will happen is we'll start to um, group, you, you know, group you guys together. Um, I'm sure depending on, you know, and, and some investors might, by the way, be in multiple tranches, um, you know, because they might say, hey, look, you know, show me what you're, you're, you're bringing to the table. Um, which is a good point. And the reason we need to get these, these numbers squared away, uh, another part of our calls, like we, we are really looking to move to the next step uh, with uh, putting out those letters of intent. Uh, but to do that, we need to know who we're working with and we have to have an idea again of sort of like, you know, no one's obligated and no one's legally bound to anything. We just need to know, Hey, look, if we find these right properties and they work, what are we, you know, what are we looking at? Uh, and there's no doubt, you know, if I have a hundred percent of the money's raised, I know that I'm going to need 150% because, you know, there's probably a good 20 or 30% of the investors who, when it's time to pull the trigger, uh, for some reason, the other uh, can't or won't um, uh, want to invest and that's okay. So we have to kind of plan for that as well. Um, all right. You know what, guys, I think I'm going to wrap that up now. That's we're right about uh, shy of 50 minutes. Uh, I'm going to stay on uh, and uh, have some, some leftover call. Uh, again, this will be available. Um, it's hopefully by tomorrow, I'll have this up on the website. Uh, so if you did not get a chance, if you had to step away or miss some part of it, or you want to re-listen to it, it'll be available for you. And if there are any other investors or friends or family, people that you know that may want to learn more about real estate investing uh, and passive income through multifamily real estate syndication, of course, we would certainly ask that you share the links to the audio and or invite them to our Thursday call. So that being said, I want to thank everyone again for um, being here tonight, and I look forward to our one-on-one -on -one call. So everybody, Ryan, Tina, Devin, I know who you guys are. We're going to be reaching out to talk to you guys a little bit more one-on-one. -on -one. But on that note, um, everybody have a good night.